This is the official EFL podcast with Mark Clement. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the official EFL podcast with me, Mark Clement, as we head into the international break and a severely curtailed EFL fixture programme in the knowledge that the next time we have a Saturday free of football, it will be the King's Coronation Day and every football league team will have just one game left. But where will your team be then? On this episode, we'll talk to a man who certainly knows a thing or two about promotion campaigns. It was mixed emotions on the bus and Peter Reid basically got on. He said, a lot of you sit down now. He said, I want to make one thing here and we're going to make a pact on this bus now. Nobody is leaving this team for next season. Give us one more season altogether. We stick together. We will go up as champions with record points. And for one of those involved, he's got a foot in several camps. You know, I've got a lot, a lot of family in Barnsley, uh, all my dad's side. Um, most of them still live in Barnsley. I, you know, whenever I'm in Barnsley, I, I, I will see them. And obviously I'm from Sheffield, my dad plays Sheffield Wednesday. So there is, there's a few links there, but yeah, for me, it's about just doing doing right by Ipswich and you know they give me the chance to come and play for a club that if I'm honest I probably didn't realise was as big as it is until until I got here and sort of experienced that from the fans. It's the officially AFL podcast. Three times he was promoted to the Premier League with Sunderland, where he also played for Leeds United and Newcastle United. He lists Bristol City, Carlisle United, where he won another promotion, Hull City and MK Dons, as his other EFL clubs. He also spent time with three teams in Australia, and that was where he dipped his toe into management for a season and worked as a TV pundit. We are delighted to say that Michael Bridges is back with us. Bridgie. Never in the history of the official EFL podcast, and I think we're coming up to three full seasons in its current format, has anybody taken as much meticulous care over their background as you, mate? So that's your own Carlisle shirt behind you. Yes, thanks for having us on. I'm looking forward to it, mate. Yes, that is my Carlisle United shirt behind me from the time there with uh, Paul Simpson and the Sheffield Wednesday shirt. Even though I did have a million clubs, mate, and I didn't know how long the intro was going to be if you'd read all the clubs out, that is actually <laughs> Richard Cresswell's shirt. So we knew, knew each other from the under-21s with England and played against Richard. And I just love collecting jerseys, Clem. That was one of the things I'm, you know, just to, when I look back on to have a look at all the teams that you've played against and they're, they're good memories, mate. So I thought, I'd, you know, it's the AFL podcast. I'll put them up. Mate, I mean, we are absolutely honoured. You did have me when you when you reached for a Chef Wed shirt, going back over that copious CV of yours, going, did I miss some in there? Did he play for Chef Wed? <laughs> we should say as well, just to make you feel very old, that obviously Richard Cresswell is Charlie Cresswell, who is on loan from Leeds to Millwall. It's his dad. And we're getting a lot of this these days, aren't we? In fact, we've got it a little bit later on on the official EFL podcast when David Hurst's son... George is going to join us, mate. We're all getting very old. <laughs> we certainly are. The thing is, I've got my son and daughter. I've got twin boy and girl. They're six, 16. Big year for GCSE results coming back to the UK. My son just plays Sunday League football with his mates. He enjoys it. And my daughter was at Walls End Girls Club. I was a Walls End Boys Club ad. She's also made the pathway for Newcastle United. So fingers crossed that there's something in the blood on one of that. One of them's got something. And they absolutely love it, mate. So um, hopefully I'm talking about her in a few years to come. Me too, my friend. Um, I, I kind of, a little bit, you'd been over in Oz so much that I kind of had you down for staying there or maybe making it a long-term thing, but maybe you've hinted at why you came back because the kids were at that age where they needed to get those qualifications. What, done within the British system? It, well, do you know what it is? It was it's living over there 12 years, absolutely fantastic. It was a beautiful part of the world, Newcastle in Australia, Two hours north of Sydney, and the demographic there was there was Walls End, Jesmond, Hexham, Killingworth, Morpeth were all in the same region, except it was thirty five <laughs> degrees. There was no dog poo on the beaches over there. It was clean, um, but COVID was it was it COVID was a huge thing living over there for the for the two and a bit years. I know everybody struggled around the world, but that was a big thing. You're so far away from family and friends, and you know that's that's yeah. the main thing. And obviously, I, I really missed when we were coming back at Christmas time. And for holidays, just watching the football and the culture around football. You're playing fifth and sixth fiddle behind all the Australian sports over there. 
And I just love being back and embracing it. Family and friends, nothing better. And football, I call it me three Fs. They're absolutely brilliant. Family, friends and football. There you go, Clem. Oh, mate. Well, we're honoured we've got you on. I'd, actually, just to finish the Australia chat, I mean, we did have Charlie Austin on who went over and only lasted three or four months yeah. because the other thing is, if you have got family in the UK, there's that 11-hour time difference. So when your day is reaching its dying embers, people are just getting up over here. And it's hard because people have got little bits of work. And if you miss that window when you can actually call people, you could end up going weeks and weeks and not speaking to people. Well, exactly. And that can be a good thing if you don't want to speak to people ever again, mate. But I'm, I'm, I'm a sociable guy and I love it. So I, I really miss that side of it. Like you say, the time difference and everything. And Charlie will be speaking about him later in the podcast because he's he's just ripped in with four goals this weekend. And, I, you know, I, I was gutted he left the A-League, but I was delighted he played a part. So we'll, we'll chat about him later on and talk about the experiences. Look forward to it. Just before we, we talk generally about the EFL, when I... When I sort of read out those marker clubs of your career, Bridgie, is there, a, is there a part of your career that makes you really happy to think back about it and maybe another part of it where it makes you a little bit sadder? Um, the, the, yes, that's a great question, Clem, because a cert, there's, there is certain things, obviously I had, I think life and football in general, in people's business and work, it's all about the ups and downs, the roller coaster ride, I call it snakes and ladders. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a great start in my um, youth career and got the opportunity to play for Sunderland and get two promotions um, to the Premier League, like you mentioned under Peter Reid. You go to the Premier League and you get injuries. Um, and I had a great first season there and then injuries. So what, what played a huge part in me getting my love of the game back was, was going down the divisions to play again for Sunderland, go to Bristol City, to have a go down at Carlisle United where I got the love of the game back. I was playing regular again. And it was to, the, the hardest thing was to get the mindset. You still think mentally that you can play at the elite level and you want to be back to where you are. And because of injuries, you lose that pace uh, and in, in the ability to, to get, you know, to get to that level where you need to be. So I'll, I found me love of the game back because I was playing regular again, got a move to Hull City again in the championship under Phil Parkinson. So I was still getting my football fix, um, but it did take us a few seasons to get used to playing in the lower divisions. That might sound really egotistical, but I still felt like I could get back when realistically I couldn't. And once I absorbed that and got rid of that egotistical and, and appreciated that I'm playing football at the level where I belong, that's when things started really happening again. I started getting um, the goals and playing with a love for this team, Carlisle United, behind us. Yeah, um, I, I guess I asked the sadness question because you were flying in particular at Leeds United. If my memory serves me right, you finished third one of the seasons. Yeah. You Was it the semi-finals of the UEFA Cup? You were absolutely flying. And that's when you're kind of dehabilitating injury, the one that kind of changed the direction of your career came on. And that's why I used the word sad. But yeah. I'm guessing you're the kind of guy that's processed that and doesn't, dwell on it and overly emphasize just accepts the fact that it is the ebb and flow of life. It, t it took a long time because early on in my career, um, when I was not even a professional or an apprentice at the time, you know, when you're 13, you're at Newcastle School of Excellence and you get rejected and told you're not good enough. So you, 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 you get, I became resilient. I wanted to really, really have another go. And then I went to Middlesbrough when I was 15 and had a trial there and sadly didn't make it again. And you start to think... Very oh, sadly, you didn't make well, it there, there Michael go. Bridges. It, Very sadly. <laughs> There's one you didn't know about. So, And it was third time lucky, and I was right right place, right place at the right time, but I, I never let it get to us. I tried to turn the negatives into positive, and I had a really good mindset. Uh, my dad put that into us. But when when I got injured at Leeds United and I was out for two years with back-to-back -back serious injuries, that's when I really struggled mentally, and it took us a lot of help from friends and family in the football club to get us back on the right track to... I'd lost my purpose, basically, and it took us a long time to get over that and get back to having the drive to, to get fit again. Um, and I really lost lost my way, but thankfully, you know, we, we got there in the end. And like you say, it took us a while to find the love of the game again or to find somewhere where I was able to compete once again. So... Yeah, it wasn't an easy journey, but I think just from having that instilled in us in a youngster, it made us, it did make, make us a lot more stronger because I could have been really, really vulnerable. Just while we're wrapping up you, yes, I just 
Obviously, Roy Hodgson has come back to Crystal Palace at the age of 75 to the end of the season to try and help them. Neil Warnock is already in at Huddersfield Town and got himself an important win at Millwall at the weekend. Age, you were had that brief period at Newcastle United with the legend of all legends, Sir Bobby Robson. Yes. I worked out he was 71 at the time. For anybody that's casting doubts that these great football people can still do it past 70, yeah. what was that time with Sir Bobby like, albeit brief? It was a very, very brief time, and Sir Bobby was probably the grandfather that I never had. Um, he was the most honest manager I've ever played under, and I wish it had been a longer period under him um, for, for the age. And like you say about Hodgson and Warnock, they might not be able to get around the training park as much as they would have liked. But what he, what he did, he had a guy in John Carver who was there to do the tactical sessions. What Bobby was, was, he, was a, he was a man manager and he tried to keep that collective group as best as he could together and man manage them. And if you weren't selected um, for, the, um, for the bench or you weren't selected for the starting eleven he would actually invite you into his office. So I remember three or four of us sitting in the office there and he would explain to each one of you why and where and offer you a cup of tea and say, you know, you've missed out this this week because of this. And it was just so refreshing because I'd heard so much BS in the past where you're thinking managers have told you a complete lie or they haven't even explained why. And it was just so refreshing to understand why. Um, and just to give you an, an idea, he he had offered me a new contract, another year extension, because he he said we still got there's still something in there that I want, but you're not fit enough yet, and I need another season under you. So you know that was really nice. I remember at the end of the year, I got beat off Marseille in the European Cup. Didier Drogba had like the world's best two legs against Jonathan Woodgate, and. What I remember is in the summer, just at the off season, um, we hadn't actually signed. We're just about to negotiate. I was driving two leads, and I was actually just passing your neck of the woods in Middlesbrough, coming over the flyover. Oh. And I got a phone call oh, off yeah. Bobby, and Bobby said to me, um, "Are you are you in the car, Michael?" I said, "Yes." He said, "Can you pull over somewhere so I can have a chat with you?" Um, and I, I said, "I'll ring you back when I do." So I pulled over, and he was all about apologising because he'd reneged on the contract offer that he'd he'd said about me, and he said, "But what I am going to do." It's out of my hands. I'm going to find you and help you get another football club. Um, I'm really sorry. I'll never go against my word. I told you I could give you another contract, but I can't, unfortunately, due to circumstances. I'm, are you okay? Do you need us to get somebody to come and meet you in the motorway there? And I was kind of like, he was doing everything just wow. to make sure I was fine. And I was obviously absolutely gutted. So I put the phone down to Bobby. Um, I said, I'll ring him back once I got the house. And I rang my dad and I told my dad what had happened. And he said, well, son, did you not ask Bobby how he was? And I says, no. He said, well, he's just been sacked. He never mentioned no. it. All he was bothered All he was bothered about was me. He never mentioned no. it. Yeah. So that just shows you the mentality of Sir Bobby. He was he was all about, and he did. He helped me get a, a club. I, I got to Bolton Wanderers with Sam Allardyce. Um, so there you go. That's, that's Sir Bobby in a nutshell. Yeah. He's all about everybody. Man manager, I mate. And that that you said you mentioned the granddad you never had. Yeah. That that gulf does the respect overpower the the kind of gulf in ages between you because the, oh without a shadow of a doubt it's respect isn't it? it yeah. It, and that's what it is like yeah. he, the yeah. knowledge and the trophies that he won. I mean the, I love the more than a manager documentary about Sir Bobby. It's incredible. It just shows you know like how we've had the relationship with the journalists. You had relationship with the staff. You made sure everybody at the football club was respectful to every staff member. And if you weren't. Then you were you you know you were you were outed, um, whether it was the kit kit people, the ground staff, the team um, persons, it, it was incredible. He just had this lovely. It, it was just you, you know he, he was he was brought up the right way, and he tried to pass that on to others and mentor them, and he did that spectacularly for me. And you can see the knowledge that he had in football that he, he just couldn't get on the training park to deliver it, but tactically he knew he knew what he was doing. He had John Carver alongside him. Um, and, and sadly, you know, I, I, sadly at, at the end of his reign, it was um, cancer got Bobby for the sixth time. I think he, he he battled it five times, and there was a lovely thing. So Bobby Robson five, cancer one, and um, yeah, he'll always be remembered so fondly in so many people's lives. And I just wish I'd had longer with him, mate. To be honest with you. Great stories, thank you for sharing. In the Skybet Championship, Wigan Athletic have been docked three points by the EFL for failing to pay player salaries in March, having previously been given a suspended penalty for a similar breach. And the Rotherham United-Cardiff City game 
was abandoned after heavy rain caused the pitch to become unplayable. The EFL will review the circumstances of that where Cardiff City were leading by a goal to nil. Should we start in the with the with the last remaining team in EFL team in the FA Cup because Manchester United Manchester City thrashed Burnley 6-0 but it was Sheffield United with a late goal against Blackburn that took them through to the the semi-finals I guess there might be a few Middlesbrough fans can't think who any of they are those are Bridgie who might be thinking oh this is this will be quite good for Sheffield United taking their eye off the ball in the league yeah Yes, without a shadow of a doubt, it is. Yeah, and and you think, I mean, that game was incredible. Uh, Blackburn, Sheffield United, the the late drama, the the unbelievable strike um, to get through, and obviously it's a Man City player on loan that got the goal. He's good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, I thought it was, you know, it was it was incredible scenes to be honest with you. But I, when I saw that going, and I was thinking, ooh, this is this is interesting because Michael Carrick and Jonathan Woodgate, you know, I'm, I'm friends with both of them. The job that they are doing at Middlesbrough, maybe. This is just, you know, a, a bit of a distraction for Sheffield United going to Wembley. And obviously, I used to room a host. They used to be in the same hostel as Paul Heckingbottom, who was the Sheffield United manager. So, wow. uh, you know, it's it's going to be an interesting um, to see what happens in the championship. Now, I would. Uh, this is the question to Sheffield United: Do you want to be at Wembley and get? You know, are they going to beat Man City? They've got they've got a chance. Put it that way. But do they? Would you rather have a trip to Wembley or get promoted? That's the that's the you know get promoted or or that. It's always something that's a question that uh, as a player I want to go to Wembley, you know. But if we lose out on automatic promotion or we don't get promoted, then have you taken your sight off what is the the main game and to get to the Premier League and play these teams every single week? Or as a fan, do you want a trip to Wembley and hopefully try and get a, another go? So it, it's incredible. But I do think, and you're going to be happy with this. I think they are going to take their eye off the off the um, championship, and Middlesbrough are going to um, going to sneak in there, Clem. I really do. I, I have to say, I I did text Hecky on Sunday morning to say I can wish you good luck today because you're playing in the cup. I can't do it. I can't do it at <laughs> any other in the league in the in, in the league yeah. in, in the season. the The alarming thing though was that Burnley have been absolutely flying mm. in the Skybet Championship, but got regally trousered yeah. against Manchester City in the Cup. Is is that frightening, the gulf between the two divisions, or it's just what Manchester City have come to do over the last few years, which on their day can stick a load in the back of the net well, against anybody? I'm a massive Star Wars fan, right? So you think Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? That is Pep Guardiola, yeah. right? Vincent Company is like Luke Skywalker. Yes. He's, he's been under him. He's worked under him. He's seen what he's doing, and basically <laughs> Pep Guardiola has given him his, his, you know, he's given him license to have a look at what he does. But what he didn't give him license to was the Plan B, how you can beat the press and how you can play through the lines. And Pep Guardiola, to be fair, I mean, you know what Vincent Company has done is, is been absolutely incredible. The transition from Burnley statistics with the ball, you know, the final third breakthroughs, um, goal XPs things like that. It's gone through the roof. So you can see he's doing such a good good job there. But Pep Guardiola has obviously got these lads ticking on a different level. He's seen this calibre before and he's, you know, they've, they've just beaten, um, they just, you know, Holland just got five midweek as well. So it's it just shows you the level, the gulf in difference. So I like to think that Vincent Company's learned a lot from that for next time they go into the Premier League because he still tried to go with the press. They went with the same style of play. And they just got picked off. Um, you know, the, I think the numerical advantage in the midfield with players dropping in really hurt Burnley. But you know, I, I credit, I credit Vincent Company not changing it because he believed in his philosophy. He thought we're going to go there with the same mindset. What's the point in trying to play something different for a week? Um, let's let's have a right good go. So I, I really really respect that. But um, like I say, Pep didn't give him the Plan B book, unfortunately. But the, that will not damage yeah. their that will not damage their promotion. I mean, eighty three points. Third, what is it? Thirteen clear of Sheffield United. It's um, it's phenomenal what they have done this season. Yeah, they need three more wins yeah. just to remind everybody. Yeah. Uh, just to square the circle as well, Brighton put out Grimsby by five goals to nil, and Manchester United beat Fulham. For those that like to complete the little uh, circle, rectangle, whatever you want to call it. Can we talk about Tuberac, Pom? You can yes, either, please. You've already name-dropped your mate, Michael Carrick, or you can give me your perspective. The guy scored 24 league goals. I'm just going to remind everybody that only three players in the history since we rebranded as the Skybet Championship have scored 30-plus. They were 
Glenn Murray got 30, Ivan Tony got 30, and obviously Alexander Mitrovic might just be uncatchable having scored 43. 43. Yes. But of those 24 goals, 20 have come since Michael Carrick's arrival for yeah. Tuba. Now, let's be clear about this. There's a lot of erroneous statistics going around, and I'm not going to chance my arm on them because I'm not confident in one or two of them. That, people, But it, it's along the lines of in nine previous seasons, he scored about 15 league goals. Yeah. So he didn't even have a squad number, I think I'm right in saying, at the start of the season. Well, and the guy is now being talked of in this revered company of those strikers I've just mentioned, Mike. Yeah, yeah it's phenomenal. And like you say, I think his previous best goal tally in one season was for um, PAOK in the Greek Super League. Uh, eight goals and 33... Pauk. 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 Yeah, I was wondering how you... you know, I didn't know how you wanted to go. Pauk. Eight goals and 33 yeah. appearances. So that, that shows where he was at. Now, that was his best prolific season with eight. And you think the difference in the transformation since Michael Carrick has come in... Um, I just think he's he, he's given him something like a, a, almost a new lease of life, and what he has done. I think under Wilder they were playing a lot more. You correct me if I'm wrong here with you being the Middlesbrough man. I didn't think they like throwing numbers forward, um, and what I've seen from the attacking prowess now, obviously with he's got Archer um, alongside of him, who I think has been an incredible addition, um, Ramsey. And the Aussie boy, Riley McGree, a great addition. He, he was a fantastic attacking midfielder, and and when I watch Middlesbrough attack now. I call it like uh, the player with that five in attack. So I call it the W. You've got your three wide and you've got your two number 10 sitting in there in the pockets. And they just seem to be dissecting teams. And the first goal last week against, was it Cardiff or Swansea? Who would you be 4-0? Uh, are we talking a, a bit Preston at the weekend? Preston, sorry. Weekend. Preston 4-0. The first yeah. goal that uh, typifies what Middlesbrough and Michael Carrick have done. It was a little bit of combinational play from the midfield, a little give and go around the box, and it was just absolutely beautiful to watch. And I just think the the freedom that he's given, it, it I think Michael has recognised that he's got what he's what he's done, he's got the teams playing out and they've got playing some lovely football. And I think he's just said to him, go and play as that number nine and hang around inside that penalty area. He's got the he's got the pace, but don't go drifting. Don't try to get involved in the midfield. We've got players that can do that. You just make sure you entertain the defenders. And anything that pops in behind them, you've got the pace to do it. And you know what I've, I've noticed? He's, he's taken a lot more shots, and he's, in, he's, he's just got this confidence. And that, for me, has got to come from the change in manager. There is no doubt about it. Carrick has just given... And it, you've got to credit him for whatever they're doing on the training park, but also... The way he's, he's managing the team and where where they have gone from under Michael Carrick, but I just I love the attack and dimension that they've got now. I really really do. It's just making me realise ever more of how many latent souls there are out there, how many players that are just waiting for the right set of circumstances yeah. to click and have the sort of season that Tuba yeah. Akpom is. And sometimes if you're not if you don't feel loved or you don't have that little run that gets some momentum yeah. you're, you're a little lost soul hiding in the, hiding in the background it makes me wonder how many more there are out in, there and Clem think of think of Jonathan Woodgate as well haven't you he'd been the manager there he, he knew the academy he got the job there um, turned obviously yeah. got, got released and gone to have the the ambition the character come back when Michael Carrick has said listen I need somebody to be alongside you know the club um, I need you to, to be my eyes and ears and come in with me that, that took that was a big pill for Jonathan Woodgate to swallow to go back there but he was obviously he's embraced no. it. He's got a hunger and a desire to prove a lot of people wrong. And Michael Carrick, he's got a he's got a hunger and a desire to prove people wrong because there's a lot of players that have gone on to be coaches, managers that haven't had that success early on. I don't think they've gone away and done the done as much as they have in the in the lower divisions. He's been at Manchester United and now he's got his own philosophy and style of play. And I think as a Middlesbrough fan yourself, to see the transition from how Middlesbrough played beforehand to what they do now. It is absolutely awesome. So long may it continue. I think even the hierarchy at the club will be pinching themselves at Middlesbrough's yes. transformation with an upward trajectory. But I do want to talk to you about QPRs in the opposite direction because on the 21st of October, QPR were top of the Skybet Championship table and they are now 41 points off the top yeah. and have got themselves in some really sticky doo-doo. Do we put this down to that uncertainty? Michael Beale had got them believing and yeah. flying. Then he was linked to the Wolves job, which he subsequently didn't have. But that seemed to undermine them. And then within a month, he's gone off to Rangers. They yeah. try Neil Critchley. And now poor Gareth Ainsworth has come in. But, you know, four defeats in his first 
five, including a thrashing at Blackpool last week. I mean, it's a, it's a, I don't want to use catastrophic. That's too strong a word, but it's, it's well, stark, isn't it? This it, fall from grace. It really is. And, you know, Beal, who I, I've admired for so many years when I've been going through my coaching badges, you know, you go through your, your license and you look for some inspiration from people to learn off. And Michael Beal was one of the guys that was happy to share things online, um, ready available even on YouTube and documents like that about how to put on training sessions, to do your documents, to show you what he's all about. So I think when Steven Gerrard had him as well, he, he loved having him alongside of him. And you think what happened with Gerrard after he lost Beal. I think he was he was a major player um, for Gerrard behind him. And obviously Michael had ambitions to go on himself. And you think of, he did a fantastic job for QPR. Everybody was loving him. And you, you know what I was loving? The fact that a manager had turned the Premier League team down and he wasn't going to go against the grain and stick with his team. And then Rangers yeah. come calling and he went, right, okay, see you later. And I think what, I, yeah. I reckon a lot of the players at QPR had uh, had basically, not I'm not going to say sulking, but will be missing Beal. And he's a hard act to follow, uh, no doubt about it. And like you say, the fall from grace with the results that they have done. It's I think you've got to I've I was checking out and I've gone back to the twenty sixth of December versus Cardiff was their last clean sheet. Um since wow. their one nil victory over Watford, which was two weeks ago. So that just shows you and, and then you get beat off you get beat off Birmingham and then you're getting flogged off Blackpool, like you say. It's the it's the goals they have been conceding. Um they, they kind of keep clean sheets and clean sheets. Win your games. I hate to say it. Mourinho's been one of the best. And another team we'll probably talk about um, in the podcast. They've got a fantastic clean sheet record in the lower division. So that he's, Gareth has got a very, very tough job on his hands. Um, there's no doubt about it. Got to get the galvanizer players. But if he has got anything, um, I, I like his character. I like what he's about. He doesn't shrug at anything from the media side of it. And I think his it, it, whether he's charmed and get them over and get them a few results, but you think where they were. Um, there's no doubt about it. They are in a, they'll be in a world of pain, the QPR fans and the players. But I still think they're regretting losing Beal because I think he's a he's a major player in football. Yeah, they are six points from the relegation zone at the moment. So they've yeah. got a cushion, but there's no question they're going to need a couple more wins to have a... Uh, a not too itchy back end of the season. Just remind everybody there are no fixtures in the Skybet Championship this coming weekend because of that international break into Skybet League One. Before we commend Barnsley for ending Sheffield Wednesday's 23 match league match unbeaten run, we have to rejoice and congratulate Darren Moore, don't we? Half a season unbeaten, Bridgie. It's an yeah. astonishing achievement. Yes, it certainly is. And think of the FA Cup win as well against Newcastle United. You know, and an old colleague of mine, Dean Windass, his, his young boy, Josh, was was the, the standout player. Um, and like you yeah. say, the chef, I've put the Chef Wedge shirt up behind us there, Clem, because um, I think he's done an amazing job. I knew we were going to talk about Darren Moore. And yeah, like I say, to go that long, um, it was interesting to bump into Darren Moore at Newcastle. Um, he, he'd gone to do a spying mission on them. Um, he was there by himself. I, I walked past him, we caught eyes and we had a chat and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm coming here to see who our next competitors are going to be in the FA Cup. And I was like, oh, good on you. Um, good luck with that one. And tell you what, he'd done his homework. So it just shows that he's, he, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's willing to put in the, the hours to go and scout by himself and do that. And instead of just relying on somebody else, he wanted to see it, you know, personally. And I've got to credit that. So fair play to Barnsley. Um, to, do you know what it is? Because when they've when they've gone on to win that game four two and 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 stop them, um, I, 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 when it got back to two two, I honestly couldn't see anybody winning the game apart from Sheffield Wednesday. So the thing that would have hurt Darren Moore is the defensive mistakes that they made and gifting Barnsley with a couple of the chances. Um, I've got I've got to say that that would have hurt them. But you've got to credit it because Barnsley have given themselves a hell of a leapfrog there with that with that result. Well, I, you know, and again, I don't know if you know Michael Duff particularly well or you've been plotting his progress, but obviously got Cheltenham promoted eight, sorry, 10 league wins in their last 12 matches and two games in hand on Plymouth Argyle, who are top. So that would take them to 78 points. Plymouth are currently on 80, 80 points. So they are right in yeah. the mix there. They certainly they are. are. That, like right I say, that, that result. In the mix. Um, I've, I loved the first goal, Devante call. The first goal I thought was quality. The timing of the run and the acute angle of finish. They set Barnsley on the way. I thought it was absolutely magnificent. And um, 
yeah, but you know what it is? It was just that that mix up, the defensive mix up that gifted um, Barnsley a, th- a third goal, and then it was the counter attack that caught Sheffield Wednesday out. So, fair play, the promotion push. There's a lot of teams battling it out, and um, yeah, like you say, it's uh, it's unfortunate for Darren Darren Moore, but um, one man's loss is another man's gain. And also, you know what? When when Burnley lost only their second game of the season, I think Vincent Company said maybe it'll do us good because it allow us to press the reset button. I wonder why. I wonder whether Darren Moore might view it something similar. Nobody, of course, wants to lose, but sometimes a long and beaten run can become a little bit of a millstone. Maybe it brings a tad of caution because people are more protecting the unbeaten run. It's got to come to an end. To... It's got to come to an end sometime, hasn't it? Of course it has. Of course it has. Yeah, that's football. So you, yeah, so that's how. It so what? What? What is the challenge now for for Darren Moore is to you know re- press that reset button, get them focused again? How they're going to? As the, the the old saying that is the bounce back ability. You know that one Clem that came into the game. So it's going to be interesting. They'll show yeah. their true character, and and again, this could be the little you know the the runner form now. Barnsley four four wins back to back. You got Ipswich on a on a runner five with a form guide. Um, and Sheffield Wednesday out the top four have probably got that worst now with a, a loss and a draw with three wins. They've got the worst form yeah. um, when you consider how long they've gone for a run. So let's see what happens. It's, it it all makes for an exciting form, time. Richie, can't you? you can do what, sorry? Of course it does. Yeah, I said you can do absolutely anything with form, can't you? you, you on, the can. other, on the one hand, I could embrace the 23 match and beat and run, and there's you telling me Sheffield Wednesday have got the worst form of the top three. Well, the there moment. you go. I absolutely love the way we can <laughs> we just twist spin it into, around. I, I, <laughs> I tell you what, Plymouth Argyle are like a dog with a bone, aren't yeah. they? I yeah. mean, I keep thinking they're going to fall away and they just dig those teeth in. The little Scotty dog at the postman's leg is gnashing away and having a bit of shin in, it, in their mouth. And there they are. They're back on top again. Yeah, scoring goals and keeping clean sheets in the last two matches. Impressive. And, and you know, when I look at the running as well, there's not many of the teams that they are playing in around the um, the top, top five or six. So they've got a nice... Nice. Um, they've got Morecambe, Lincoln, Exeter, Shrewsbury. They've all, they've almost done the hard yards as it is, mate. So I would suggest that they are just plain sailing. No pun intended with the ship um, of the of the badge, but I, I think they're done and dusted, mate. There you go. They're 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 clean. They're gone. Can we draw on a little bit of your own promotion experience? Were the common denominators in those four promotions that you had that you where you could you could feel and smell the same sort of characteristics across all of them, or was every one very different? Um, oh, Clem, good questions, lad. You're good at this, aren't you? Um, yeah. Is it, uh, is it, thank I you. Mean, the, is, the, it, is it like, the, is, it, is there a, a team cohesion? Is it team spirit? Is it blend of players? Is the, it squad size? The first size? promotion under one? Peter Reid was definitely the characteristics of all the lads realising that we were onto something and the games couldn't come quick enough. We just knew anybody we were up against, we could get a result. Um, then, if you remember, Michael Gray missed a penalty against Charlton Athletic in the final and Man- Clive Mandonka scored a hat-trick that sent Charlton up in the playoffs. We missed out that year. Yeah, and what I remember was getting back on the bus on the coach afterwards. And there was a lot of players were talking about, there was, there was a lot of things where the players, if they don't get the Premier League this season, where they're going to be making moves and going elsewhere and getting opportunities to play in the Premier League with other teams. And Peter Reid got on the bus and Mickey Gray was obviously crying his eyes out. He was there. Everybody's trying to console him. A few of the lads were punching him. Um, for what he'd done, so oh, it was dear. mixed emotions. I'm going to laugh at you. Mixed emotions on the bus. And Peter Reid basically got on. He said, a lot of you sit down now. He said, I want to make one thing here, and we're going to make a pact on this bus now. Nobody is leaving this team for next season. Give us one more season altogether. We stick together. We will go up as champions with record points. And everybody like, kind of looked, and he said, we're going to get drunk all the way home to the Northeast now and get forget about this. And what did we do? We stuck together. Nobody left, and that was the season that we went up as record winners. So there's there's things that, that you can talk about um, when you – sign brilliant players to get them to get you in and get you a promotion. That was off the back of Peter Reid making sure that we were all together in unity and ready to go again next season and getting rid of all the cobwebs. And again, just something you learn as a player when you go into coaching later life that you can talk about all the tactics that you want. But if you can get a team singing off the same page that are so together um, on and off the field, uh, we that was, that was a special year. So that was different to the first promotion. And then the one under Mick McCarthy uh, when I went there in 2005, 2006, 
that again was different. I was playing a bit part player. There was a guy came in on loan. There was a few of the lads there on loan, and he really gelled the team in other ways by getting a few players to sign, um, and found a diamond in uh, Stu in, in Elliot, the goal scoring machine with Marcus Stewart. You know, so yeah, it was a it was a very very. It, it, it I think it's it's all about getting that right blend, and too many too many cooks spoil the, spoil the food. That can also happen in football, but the three promotions I had were very very different. Listen, um, uh, just fit. I just want to talk to you about managerial fit as well, because um, Burton Albion had only won five in the first 26. Suddenly, they've won six out of 10. And there's a, there's a manager there, Dino Marmria, and it, 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 it just feels as though his personality, the way he does stuff, the way he carries the club, is the perfect blend. Do you believe in that? Have you come across plenty of times before where... Something looks all right on paper, but when an individual gets in situ, they're a little bit square in a round hole. And then on other occasions, it's the perfect drop in. The peg ain't going to come out. It just sits in snugly and it's sorted a bit like what Dino's done at Burton. Yeah. Well, I mean, Paul Simpson coming in at Carlisle United. He's not only has he wow, done it, yeah, not only absolutely. has he done it when I was there and got, you know, you yeah. getting promotion with Paul Simpson. He had. He had the dynamics where Simo was an ex-player. He was learning his trade. He, he knew what he wanted from the games. Um, and he wanted us really, really fit. And he signed a couple of players on loan from higher divisions, which was instrumental. And the other thing he had, he had a guy in Dennis Booth as his assistant manager who was a practical joker, an old school guy. And he would be the one that we would all go and talk to and have a laugh with. And Simo kept like, he was in the banter, but he always kept straight face. He knew he was the gaffer. And I think that you just show what has happened. He's taken over at Carlisle United yet again. And the transformation yeah. has just been apparent. He knows what he wants. He, he gets everybody in the football club involved. He gets the fans back believing. Um, so he, he has got a recipe that he knows what he, what he wants and he's, he, he gets success from that. And then, like you say, there's other ones where you, they come in and they, no personality. They've got this, it's always about them and never the football club or the people, uh, you get you get found out very quickly when you find out that they, they don't last very long. Skybet League One fixtures this coming weekend and it is a curtailed programme. Wickham are currently eighth, four points off the playoffs go to Charlton, Accrington in the relegation zone are at Exeter and MK Dons against Morecambe. That is 20th against Czech's table because he's failed to complete his sentence when he's written his notes down. MK Dons against Morecambe is 20th against 22nd. And Derby, who suffered their first home league defeat in five months last weekend and are in fifth day travel to Peterborough. Skybet League 2, well, you've, you've mentioned it. There's a lovely cat and mouse going on at the top. It's always sad when a manager loses his job, though, because Mickey Mellon, who had won a double promotion, his first spell at Tranmere Rovers, was sacked by Mark Palios, the chairman at Tranmere, who said, from a personal and club perspective, this hasn't been an easy decision. That's tough, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, sometimes sometimes owners have to do stuff that they really do not want to do. Yeah, yeah and it, like you say, second spell there as well, uh, Mickey Mellon. So that, that I think that's why the decision wasn't easy when you've got familiarity with the club and what's gone on. And a similar thing happened at Hartlepool this season, if you think, with Keith Curl. He was, he was brought in. Um, Raj had got him in there and you know the results hadn't been going the fans were turning and the, the owner wants to try and prove that he is right and stick by his man that he brought in and had to make a change and he said it wasn't an easy decision because you know when, you, when you've when you got that relationship off the field with the manager and you want him to do well because you've brought him in it's, it's never easy and that's the situation here with Tramia but six wins since mid-October and not scoring enough goals I think that's what's cost him um, and I, I think they're in the position now, Clem, where you've got to have a look at. I, I wouldn't, if I was Tramia, I wouldn't jump in to make an appointment at this moment in time, right? Because they're sitting pretty in the, you know, they're, they're not going to get relegated. They're not going to win, go for the promotion. So if you just let Ian, Ian Dow's and assistant Andy Park and run with it until the end of the season, and what it gives you time to do now is see what they're about, gives them an opportunity, see if they're willing to take on, on the job at hand, if they, if they deserve it. Or you can go through the interview process and make sure you get the right person that understands and is in alignment with the club's philosophy and where they want to go. Because I think that's a, the, yeah. the biggest thing for me is when you get somebody in to a football club and it's a, it's a spur-the-moment thing that happens. And they've got to be impressed by something in the interview. 
But then when you realise that, you know, the, the, the club might have a thing where they want to bring some youngsters through and try and get the academy going and, and get them game time to either sell them on or just have something in the production because it's easier to get sponsorship from your local regions if you've got some youngsters coming through as well. That always helps. But if, if you're not on the same page with that and suddenly the manager's saying, oh, well, you know, it still happens in the Premier League clubs. I think Conte this season for Tottenham Hotspur had mentioned a player that they'd signed pre-season, a youngster, and he said, well, yeah, they, it wasn't my sign. So the, it, 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 you can't allow that to happen. So I think Trammy have got to be very smart here and I think they should just sit tight for now and make sure that they get the right appointment come the end, end of this season. So you, so the new manager can basically have a good go um, and, and, and get a good pre-season under his belt because, you know, that, 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 what, 12 points off relegation, I think they're, they're safe. I'd, I'd like to think they can do a job and be smart about it. Yeah, uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Ian Dawson, Andy Parkinson will caretake to the end of the season. And Mark Pallio said, I reluctantly came to the conclusion the change was needed uh, as we start recruitment preparations for next yeah. season. I've got to commend um, I've got to commend Crawley Town, who were the only EFL club without an away win. They've suddenly had a little spurt, actually, of Crawley, uh, having only taken six points from the previous 13 games and have taken seven from three since. I just wonder, what have you ever been involved in any sort of freaky form like that from a negative perspective? And just what a hang dog it is on a on a dressing room to have the eyes of the entire EFL looking on you, going, "You're the only ones who can't win on your travels." I mean, I'm not saying as dramatic as that, but have you ever been involved in a similarish sort well, of? Well, uh, I've been involved in a relegation with Sunderland from the Premier League, and the worst part about that was, uh, I think, it was the last game of the season. It was M. Um, we were playing Wimbledon at the time. And Coventry City delayed their kickoff by 15 or 20 minutes so they could see our results. So we were sitting in the dressing room waiting for that result to come in. That was horrendous. And yeah, the, the run of games, it's, it's never easy to get the results when you are struggling at the bottom of the league. And what you tend to find, I don't know if it's lady luck, but you, every decision seems to go against you. Every little, every shot that seems to go away from goal takes a deflection, ends up in the back of your net. Everything goes against you. So just for Crawley, to have something to hold on to, like you say, with them, them results. And another team, Hartlepool, just below them with four draws, you know, since they've made the managerial change. Askew's still waiting for his first win. They're, they're, you can just see them, you know, when you look at the, the form guide in the last five matches, Crowley and Hartlepool actually out the bottom <laughs> the bottom five have had better results. So it, it, there are something to cling on to, but it's, it's, um, it's still a long way to go, Clem, put it that way. So I wouldn't be relying too much on it. No, quite. Finally, and we've already alluded to it, game of last weekend, an absolute humdinger. Rochdale 4, Charlie Austin 4. <laughs> Charlie Austin put Swindon 2 nil up. Rochdale drew to 2-2, two -two, then went 3-2 up. Then Charlie got in his stride again, equalised. Then he put Swindon ahead again, and then the old war horse Ian Henderson scored in the dying yeah. hours of the game for a four-all draw. I mean, those games are just crazy, aren't they? Absolutely brilliant. All about. And do you know what I love? I love, I love the fans. 2 nil up, 3-2 down. I love all them kind of chants, you know, and then <laughs> it's just absolutely magic. And everybody forgot to sing at the end of it, 4-4 four, four draw. So it was, yeah. what, what I respect is Charlie Austin. He's, he's a proper striker. You know, when you see him, the first three goals just hanging around the penalty area, the six-yard box, he, ne he never leaves that, that area of the goal. In the time that he does when he dropped in, his fourth goal was the pick of the bunch for me. You know, an absolute screamer. So... Charlie, Charlie Austin, Swindon have got, uh, you know, the, the Australian owner. Um, Charlie's been in Australia. It, 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 what he was over there, he was, he was a lovable character, but a bit, of a, a bit of a head the ball as well, because there was a couple of scenes from inside the dressing room for Brisbane Raw, where he has a big fallout with a guy called Connor Chapman that I played with at Newcastle Jets, and they have a big ding-dong at half time. So to allow access in the A-League to get more followers, the cameras are allowed in there. So it's a, it's a great thing to have wow. a look at. Um, and Charlie really, really gives it to this to this youngster and tells it exactly how it is about how, I'm just going to put it politely, how poor his defending was. And the young lad replies by saying, well, your finishing has been very, very poor. Now, that's the polite way of saying it, okay? So if you get a chance to have a listen to it or watch it, um, I'm sure you'll find it. Brisbane Row Halftime with Charlie Austin. Um, but he was, what I love is he's come back over here and, he, and he's doing very, very, you know, he's doing, he's doing well. He's still got that hunger in his belly and that them four goals are magnificent. And he, he doesn't mind being outspoken because I'm not sure if you saw a few weeks ago, 
he had about a, a bit of a ding dong and a clash with some of the supporters of Swindon after a game where he told them to all go back, have a pint of beer and have a curry and then they'd forget about the result and he walked off. So he's, I, I, I find him an interesting character, how he's got the mentality and the mindset to, to play the football, but he's also got this thing where he doesn't mind expressing his feelings and he's a character and I think the, game, the game's got to embrace that and Swindon have got to, they've, they've, they've got a goal scorer, um, but the, the results just haven't yeah. been consistent enough. Yeah. And you know what? He brings us wonderfully full circle as we reach the end of our chat, because you were talking about having played at a higher level, parking your ego and getting used to playing at yeah. a lower level again. Yeah. And he's he, he's yeah. found his... He's embraced it. He's found his flow, hasn't it? He has. He has. Absolutely. Yeah. My final question for you is if I could... I mean, it's great to have you here available for us, dressing your shot beautifully with all your collection of shirts, <laughs> gorgeous lighting. Putting me glasses pleasure. on I this, could... putting me glasses on the same as you as well, Clem. That's old age as well, mate. There you go. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, but it, it, it's nice for you to be able to see me in all my glory, isn't it? <laughs> if I could, if I could offer you it, what would be your dream role from now on in? What, where, where are you heading with your life? What are you doing with your life, Michael? Um, do you know what? it's been a, it's been an exciting journey um since retirement it's been uh, i call it spaghetti junction since retirement of football you think it's going to be games of golf every single day you need a purpose in your life and it was it was it was very interesting to ring up old colleagues and ex managers and get some insight and some help as to what you want to do and I, uh, you know when you've played all your career and the amount of managers that i've had and the injuries and the highs and lows i've had they were saying you know you you've got to go and do your badges go and do your coaching badges get a feel for that uh, and while I was going through the five-year process of getting the pro diploma, and I was thinking, what what else can keep us ticking over? And, and you know, working in the media, watching games of football, and talking about something you love—that that's basically kept us going and paid the bills while I've been coaching at lower levels. So I, I know what I want to do, Clem. I've I've, I've done coaching with the youth team uh, in the A League over in Australia. I've been assistant manager of the pro football club. I, then I went and took a, a, a head coach's role in the in the state leagues over there in Newcastle and Sydney. Uh, and I, obviously coming back to the UK now, I, I know what I want to do, but I just want to, set up, you know, we've been, been back here this season observing the managerial roundabout that's been going on, the coaching opportunities. I want my family and kids to settle in first and foremost for which they'll finish the GCSEs this time. I don't want to go in and get a coaching job and never see them ever again because you've got to go in full hog. Do you know what I mean? It's it's 24-7. Yeah. I think Eddie Howe and Bielsa yeah. sleep at the training grounds at Newcastle and when he was at Leeds respectively. So you've got to go and you've got to have that that mindset. And that's what I want to do. I want to be a head coach of a football team at some point. Um, it's no no hidden knowledge that I did apply for the Carlisle job um, a few years back when Chris, Chris Breach got it. It was nice to come over and have the interview process. So I know where I want to be and what I want to do for my sins. Um, I probably, you know, every every ex player I see going into coaching and management deteriorates very quickly. Um, I, I think Oli Gunnar Solskjaer, the baby faced, faced assassin, turned into a granddad overnight when he was the coach. So you know, there's something in there. I just want to be able to pass on the knowledge and the mentor. And the, the thing that excites me about that and what I love is when you get the, a message from a few of the players that I've left in Australia and come over here to know that they've gone on to get a pro contract in football and a couple of them have gone to America as well. And when they just send it, it, the golden nugget for me is getting the thank yous and the time and effort that you put in to help somebody else's career. Because I think of all the people that played a major part in my my career to help me get the opportunities. And you, you take it for granted the amount of time and effort these coaches um, and people put in around the football clubs. So it's, um, it's nice to give something back. And that's what I want to do. As much as I love talking to you and doing the media, mate, um, there's there's something that there's this burning desire, and I, I know what I I know what I want to do, and and having a taste of it and a feeder of it. Um, I'm just having a little bit of time out before I go full hog into it again, mate. We'll have you back anytime. Can I just see your hair a bit closer to your to your camera, please? I just want to, while it's still in its nat natural brownish mousy colour. Yeah. Just before, just in case you get a job and we don't speak again for a we're couple of years. The, the wing, next time I wing see backs you. are just pushing on yeah. either side there now, mate. So the comb over's coming in handy, oh, okay? Yeah. But there's not many greys there. Yeah. But the, when I started coaching that's, over in the in Australia, the greys were coming thick and fast. Um, but thankfully, I've just tried managed to control it a little bit. Um, and that's called a little. I think it's called um, a Grecian three thousand whatever it is, a little bit of a bottle on there, mate. <laughs> Uh, if you are interested, we are doing a Michael Bridges hair tip podcast. <laughs> Look out for it on your normal podcast platform. Great to talk to you, mate. Thanks for joining us on the Official EFL podcast. Clem, great to chat you, mate. Thank you very much and appreciate all the listeners. Take care. 
the official EFL podcast with Mark Clement. Let's finish up this week by returning to that epic battle to get out of Skybet League One. And one of the teams right in the mix of Ipswich Town. They've won their last six, including seeing off Shrewsbury Town last weekend when their first goal was scored by George Hurst and was the six thousandth in the club's history you know when you come to a club judge do you do you try and learn a little bit about the history so that when a moment like saturday happens that's there forever you you're part of the kind of fabric of the club yeah definitely it's, it's one of those when you, you know you come down down south for me it's obviously i'm being from sheffield it's it's a different world down here um and so you do try and learn as much about the place as possible and you know, try and explore the place and, and and these little these little stats and facts and stuff like that. You try and try and get hold of them. And like I said to my to, to my girlfriend and my family after the game, it was I didn't realize until after the game that it was was a six thousandth goal. But I was it was sort of quite a happy moment. You know, when in in years to come when they reach ten thousand and you know and sort of looking back at the the, the thousandth goal of each thousand sort of thing, it's it's sort of my name's going to be there. And it's yeah, it's sort of quite a nice feeling. Yeah, I can I, I can imagine it. It feels like an enormous number as well, doesn't yeah. it? You know, it just it just it's like massive. And then you walk around the stadium and you you realise the ghost of Sir Alf Ramsey and yeah. Bobby Robson's around and all those heights. It's an, it must be a, a real extraordinary feeling there. Um, can I, the, the six consecutive wins? Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of fuss is made, George, about momentum in football. Yeah, but. Every one of those you'd clock up, does that that must increase that sense of confidence within the squad, doesn't it? Without a doubt. I mean, like we, it's probably a bit of a cliche, but you know, you can't you can't go on a run without winning the first one, and and it's always that first one that is is hard to win, and then I think the next one is even harder. You know, going and backing it up with a second win in a row, and then I think from that point on, you sort of once you get that second win, you know. I, I think it's a little bit easy to get the third, the fourth, the fifth, and you sort of, like you said, the word momentum itself. It's you sort of get yourself on a little bit of a roll, and and once you get on that roll, things just seem to happen at the right time. You know, you find yourself getting that little bit of luck that you might not have had when you weren't on a run. Um, and it's it's there's a lot of strange strange things tend to happen in in, in a spell of football like that, and it's just about you know taking advantage of it when it does come and. And, and keeping it going for as long as possible. Because obviously you want to go and win every single game you play anyway. Um, and so when you when you're on a get sort of a run going like that, obviously we've we've we've, we've won six in a row. Now it's you sort of feel like you're getting the just rewards for all the work you're putting in during the week. Of we want to win every game, and at the minute we are going and doing that. So it's just about you know sticking to our principles and and keeping that run going. But even at your young age, you'll have played a, with so many different managers, and everyone's got their own way of dealing with things. So has Kieran McKenna embraced that momentum and does he encourage you? You've won six, you can win seven, or or is he trying to bring you down and not let you get over inflated and, and too above yourselves? Because it's a delicate balance, yeah, isn't it? it? It can be a very fine line at times. And I think I think that's where the gaff has been brilliant with us, you know, during the last few weeks, especially it's like, yeah, we're, we're more than allowed to, you know, be happy with the room we're on and, you know, understand that we are on a good run at the minute and, and we are doing a lot of things right and we are playing a lot of good football and winning a lot of games but then at the same time if you sort of get blinded by that and you know that sort of takes over you a little bit it can go the other way and you sort of you come away from your principles that you talk about day in day out um the way you want to play and you, you can almost get a bit too big for your boots at times and I think that's when it can start to get dangerous so the gaffers the gaffers brilliant in in sort of sending the message of Look, you're doing really, you're doing really, really well. You're doing brilliant, but we've got another game on Saturday, and the last six games of playing really well mean nothing if you're then going to be rubbish on Saturday and and, and, and lose the game. So, um, I think he's been brilliant with in, in that sense of of keeping the lads grounded, but but also sort of letting us enjoy the run we're on as well. Even though you've only been there a couple of months with your with your loan, has he already had an effect? on your game because he's got quite a reputation as one of the great up and coming young coaches. Yeah, I mean without a doubt, you know, it's I I, I know what my strengths are and I know what they were coming coming to this club and it's sort of been it's been nice to sort of the gaffers and his staff have all helped me not only 
try and help increase my strengths and make those better. But, you know, the bits of the game, my game that I feel like I did need work on, it's, it's not a one, once a week sort of thing or, you know, do it when you feel like it. There'll be days where I don't, I, I'm tired or we've had a long session, but it's no, we keep, we keep grinding the workout. And, 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 and ultimately I, I thank them for that because, you know, it's, it probably took a little bit longer than I would have liked to get the, get the first goal um, a couple of weeks ago against Bolton. But it sort of, it was quite, you know, rewarding in the fact that I know the work that I've been putting in, the work that they've been helping me with. Um, and it's sort of the two goals that we've, that, that, that I've scored since then have, have, have been, you know, things that we've worked on in training um, and, and, and me and Granty and stuff like that after training. So it's, um, yeah, it's pretty rewarding. How do you view your career in general so far? Ooh, um, if I'm being completely honest, probably un unfulfilled potential. Um, you know, I, I, that, is being, that is being very honest, man. Yeah, yeah um, that's that's probably me being as honest as I can be. Um, and I, I I know what I'm I, I know what I'm capable of. I know what I can be capable of. You know, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's all down to me. It's I'm not saying by no means it's down to anybody else. Because ultimately, I'm I'm the one going out on the pitch on on Saturday afternoon. So, um, I, I for me, I know I can score goals. Um, you know, I, I proved that last year at Portsmouth, and and you know, hopefully now I can start doing that more regularly for for Ipswich Town. And I've, I've I have had a couple of spells um, so far where I haven't I haven't scored, and you know, there there is that question mark there and. I don't see it as as a burden. Um, I look at it as it's it's not only something for me to go and prove to everybody else, but only prove to myself. And and you know, I've I've been on a few loans and other factors. You know, settling into places quickly. You know, moving up and down the country, away from family and friends, can all sort of have factors. And you know, going to Rotherham that was my first loan at, at a men's club. And, and and was I ready when I look back? I, the, the stats would probably say no, but you know, at the time I thought I was. So I, I don't regret any of, of of where I've been and and what's happened along the way because ultimately I am just turned twenty four, um, and I think I can get you know people can get a little bit caught up in this fact of because of you know my my dad sort of being who he is and and I've probably been on the radar of a lot of people for since I was a little bit younger than than most. It's it feels like I, I feel like I've been around for a while in in that sense and. And at times I sort of do have to sort of remind myself that, you know, I am 24. I've got a lot of years ahead of me still. Um, and, you know, I, I look at it right now and I feel like I'm in, I'm in a good place. I'm at a club that I'm really enjoying being at, um, playing under a manager and that I really enjoy playing under and playing with lads who I enjoy playing with. So um, in that sense, I feel like I'm at the, right now I'm in a, I'm in a good position. There's, there's been ups and downs to get here, but right now I'm in a good position and, I know there's there's a lot more to come. Yeah, it, it, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, you mentioned the loans and then it made me automatically think of Harry Kane and the cycle he went on before he really yeah. felt comfortable back at Spurs. And then Michael Bridges, who your dad probably kicked a few lumps out or they kicked yeah. lumps out of each other a few times, was on a little bit early. And we were talking about Tuba Akpom, who didn't even have a, mm -hmm. a shirt number earlier in the season. Yeah. Sometimes, George, it's a, it's a matter of finding home, isn't it? I agree. I think it is. And I think sometimes it's it's just that, you know, little bit of luck. Um, like you say, it's Harry Kane, you know, went on a few loans that didn't quite work out, went back to Spurs and and, and I think the rest speaks for itself, you know, being at Leicester and, 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 and seeing Jamie Vardy every day, it's that's another way of going going about it. And you look at what he's accomplished now, it's 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 second to almost nobody. Um, you know, playing in the Premier League for the years he has and scoring the goals he has, winning the league and stuff like that. So I don't... Yeah, I... but George, can I interrupt yeah. you? Because I, yeah. I remember coming and doing a behind-the-scenes feature with Leicester. And, and Jamie had a very bumpy first season. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I knew him from his time at Fleetwood yeah. and I saw him sitting on a bench at Leicester before he clicked. And again, he, he it felt like I was talking to a little lost soul at the mm -hmm. time, and then suddenly he went whoosh. So it can come out of nowhere, a bit like life. No, it can, and I think I think that's what you know. It, I've 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 been guilty of getting caught up in the past. You know, you see these players who who are at the top of the game, and you sort of look at them and think, oh well, they're the best players about. It's it's always they've they've, they've always been that, and 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 none of them have. They've 
95% of them, probably more, have, have you know, had periods where it's not gone their way for whatever reason. Um, and I think that can only, that, that only makes makes people stronger. And I know it certainly has for me. I've I've, I've been you know had seasons that I've not wanted to have. I, I wish I'd score thirty goals every year, but it's it's sometimes not quite doesn't quite happen that way, and it's and it's not realistic. So I think you just got to take it as it comes, and you know make the best of every situation you're in, and 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 hopefully I can yeah start doing that now. You mentioned your old man. For those that haven't worked it out, David Hurst, Sheffield Wednesday legend, part of the 91 League Cup winning team. Um, help or hindrance having him as your old man? Massive help. Yeah, massive help. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd never, ever say it was a hindrance to anybody. Um, you know, I've been asked a lot of times, that, you know, what's it like, you know, having that pressure on your shoulders and I sort of just, I don't see it as pressure. Um, you know, I, I understand how good he was back in the day and 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 how he's viewed especially in Sheffield by by a lot of people and and what he did for Sheffield Wednesday so but to me is still just my dad who was pretty pretty good at football so I, I sort of don't see it as the the pressure side of it I don't see it as following in his footsteps or you know trying to be as good as he was I, if if, he, if we stood next to each other I'm a lot taller than he is you know these days a lot slimmer um <laughs> it's you know straight away there's a lot of difference um, yeah straight away there's a lot of difference. better look in day better yeah, look in you know I, I i'd say so he'd probably give you a different answer to that but um yeah straight away there's there's a lot of differences between how my dad used to play and, and how i play these days don't be wrong there's a, there's a lot of similarities i think and, and obviously i've learned a lot of things that i try and put into my game from him and i've watched every single goal i think he's ever scored probably 10, 15 times. I could probably name them all for you if I, if, if I really wanted to. Um, and it's just nice to have have that person there of, you know, he's, I've, I've, I've said it before and in the sense of, I'll speak to him straight away after a game and if he says I've done all right, then then I know I've had a really good game. Um, because he's, you know, that's just, that's just the way he is with me. He's, he's always been that way with me of, you know, there's always things we can improve on, but when you've done all right, yeah, you're pretty good today. Um, and for me, I've always found it as, as a massive help, you know, not not coming off the pitch, thinking have I done all right, have I not, and being told I've been amazing and brilliant and because I don't think that gets you anywhere. I think you need that honesty and, and, and he's always give it to me. And um, So, yeah, always o always a help, never a hindrance. Yeah, I do. You, you, I, I laughed to, again, not just because of your uh, chronic criticism of his <laughs> physique, but but I, it just made me wonder. You said you were familiar with all his goals, whereas when most kids were growing up, sitting on their dad's lap watching reruns of Lion King or mm. something like that, yeah. he was he was just on YouTube playing you all his best goals. Yeah. And here's one I got. Here's <laughs> one I got against against Barnsley. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a, there's a few chances I've missed in the last few years that he go back and say that was like my one at so-and-so the only difference is I put it in the back of the net so um, I try I try and learn as much as I possibly can from him for sure yeah I tell you what as well I'm suddenly fascinated by the top of the division and what you're going through with Ipswich yeah. because of course your old man was born in Barnsley yeah. and they are right in the mix yeah. and then obviously we've mentioned Wednesday yeah. you were born uh, in Sheffield, obviously, you grew up a Wednesday night as a result of your old always, man's always have been. affiliation. Yeah, always have. Isn't it? Isn't it funny when you've got a foot in all the different it's, camps? It's you know I've got a lot, a lot of family in Barnsley. Uh, all my dad's side, um, most of them still live in Barnsley. As you know, whenever I'm in Barnsley, I, I, I will see them. And obviously, I'm from Sheffield. My dad plays Sheffield Wednesday, so there is there's a few links there, but. Yeah, for me, it's about just doing doing right by Ipswich, and you know they give me the chance to come and play for a club that, if I'm honest, I probably didn't realise was as big as it is until until I got here and sort of experienced that from the fans and you know walking through the town and stuff like that. I, I probably didn't quite realise how, how big a club it was or or has been for the last however many years, and, and and that's sort of where we're trying to get back to and and seeing that for myself sort of really helped clear it up in my mind that it was it was where I wanted to be and. You know, hopefully, I can go and go and you know put this club back back in the championship. It it is remarkable that fight at the top of your division. Yeah. I mean, it's proper no inch, no quarter, isn't it? With the runs that everybody or the vast majority seem to have been on. And I was just going through the fixtures between now and the end of the season, and actually. 
there's only three games, unless I've made a mistake, where you as a top six player, so that you've got Derby coming up, yeah. then you have the rather large matter of uh, a Tuesday night, the the last week in April, you've got Barnsley away, yeah. and then Chef Wed play Derby on the last game of the season. But it's surprising mm-hmm. how few of you actually still have to play each other. I know we've, we, it feels like we've got got the big games out of the way, but you say I say big games. It's 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 that point of the season now that it doesn't matter who you play, and everyone's fighting for something. Um, you know, there's 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 the top half of the table that are fighting for promotion, playoffs, whatever it may be, and then you know the bottom half of the table who are, who are fighting to stay in the league. So it's it's there's there's no easy games in general, but you sort of get to the last ten. 10 games of the season and and those games get a little bit harder. And I think that's just where we hopefully have, you know, got a little run going and, and got that little bit of momentum going at, at just the right time. And yeah, have we, have we had our little hiccups where we've had a few draws and, you know, the teams have won? Yeah, of course. I think every team has that during the season. Um, and so fingers crossed we've got that out of the way and, 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 you know, we can just keep putting in the performances to, from now to the end of the season. Well, listen, good luck. Just before I let you go, uh, I just wanted to very quickly say, I don't know whether you wanted to pay tribute um, to David Brooks, because obviously before David switched allegiance, he played for England under-17s. You played alongside him when he won the Toulon tournament. Uh, Obviously made his comeback after stage two, Hodgkin lymphoma. He's cancer-free. I mean, what a... I mean... Fantastic to see him back at the weekend after Absolutely. what he's been through. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, I, yeah, like I said, played with Brooksy. Um, I think he nicked the player of the tournament off me at that Toulon tournament. Um, what, a, he's, what a player to what a player to lose it to. So, um, nah, he's, he's he's brilliant. I, I I still keep in contact with him. I, I play a lot of a lot of PlayStation and stuff like that. I know he's into all that, and I play a lot of that with him um, on a weekend and stuff like that. So, for the journey he's been on. Um, is a journey that you know nobody saw coming, and and is is not one that you know we can ever really prepare for. It sort of just hits you really, and 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 that's that, and you sort of have to go and deal with it. And and the way he's you know come back and then had setbacks with injuries, you know, on his on his journey, and to be back playing now is 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 amazing for himself. You know, Wales because he was he was a big part of that at the time, and you know especially and for Bournemouth as well because he's is he's a top quality player so yeah all um all, all the very best to him and it's it's uh, amazing to see him back well said listen congratulations on your place in portman road history and just one little bit of advice if i might i wouldn't let your dad listen to this episode of the officially <laughs> no, podcast no, if i was you no, otherwise you won't be going home for sunday lunch at the weekend no, no definitely not i think there'll be three uh three place mats at the table rather than four at the weekend so Great to talk to you, George. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Thank you. That is it for this episode. A big thank you to the Going Hungry This Weekend, George Hurst, and to Michael Bridges. If you've enjoyed it, please do give us a five-star rating, press the subscribe button, and share on your socials if you'd like to get in touch. Our email address is podcast at efl.com. That's podcast at efl.com. I'm Mark Clement. Join us again soon for another episode of The Official EFL Podcast.